There should be no mistake. There is no civil disobedience possible until the crowds behave like disciplined soldiers. That's Gandhi, August 25th, 1921. Gandhi here is getting at a very important principle and something that I myself have observed in campus politics being a professor at Berkeley. And that is that there's a profound difference between blowing off steam because you feel like it and taking a risk because you want to be a part of changing some injustice in society. Uh, I, I hope I'm expressing this clearly, that it's the minute you get beyond expressing personal feelings and you are engaging with your responsibility vis-a-vis -vis other human beings, at that moment, your episode is truly nonviolent. And then it could be destructive in some ways. Usually it is not. But the essential thing is that you're not doing this out of a mindless feeling. You're doing this out of a well-thought-through principle. I've noticed this in my personal experience. Uh, you'll be with a crowd of people, and they'll be descending on the administration building or something very historic like that. And some of the friends around me would be very seriously dedicated to making their needs known, and others would be more dedicated to getting their feelings expressed. And it can be hard to tell the difference from the outside. I freely admit that. But the difference will eventually make itself felt. And I myself uh, played an important role in the free speech movement in Berkeley in 1964, where I convinced uh, the graduate student assembly, who, you know, every graduate, practically every graduate student was part of the group. It was like hundreds of people. They were going to protest at a faculty meeting that was taking place the next day to basically decide the fate of our movement. And they were going to disrupt and protest. And I said, wait a minute. Let's see what they are going to say. If they're voting in our favor, we don't need to protest them. Well, my colleagues, I'm happy to say, were very impressed by that argument. And sure enough, the next day, we stood there calmly in great dignity, waiting on the professors, our professors, and they came through beautifully. They basically supported us completely. And I think to this day how we would have ruined everything by protesting them before they had a chance to express themselves. So that was one of the little episodes in my life where I started to understand what nonviolence is and what power it has and how restraint is an essential component of that power. There's a very good book by Thomas Ricks on the Civil Rights Movement, and Ricks was a military historian, and he did something very interesting. It's hard to do something new and interesting about the Civil Rights Movement. It's been covered almost as often as it deserves to be. Uh, but he looked at that movement as a military operation, and it was quite illuminating, quite eye-opening how often that model worked that it was a kind of military operation. And in a military operation, you don't just you know run out in the field and yell and scream and shoot weapons. You have to behave in a disciplined, pardon the expression, uniform way. And it was when the civil rights workers could do that that they were most effective. 